if you don't know, uh, the Buffalo Bills will play tomorrow night in the early Monday night game. <laughs> Public service announcement. Prayers can begin today. You don't have to wait till the day of. We've been talking about how do we thrive? Because I, I think we all know surviving is inadequate. Um, just getting through or getting by, we feel like something's missing. Where does that thought come from? It's not just because we see people doing better, it's because God has placed something deep within our hearts to know that we're supposed to be able to, to move through life in a way that uh, not only do we experience the goodness and grace of God, but we're able to share that with others. And so we've been talking about thriving, and we talked about God's wisdom, because when we have access to God's wisdom, we thrive. We talked about freedom, because when we are free, that's where we thrive. We don't thrive in bondage. And, and, and we also talked about uh, uh, emotionally and spiritually healthy. How, how can we be emotionally and spiritually healthy? Because a lot of us focus on one or the other instead of including both. And we thrive when we partner with the Holy Spirit. And so we're in this series on the Holy Spirit, and we're in Luke chapter 4 today. And it says that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, that's where he was baptized, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to if you worship me. It will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up by their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. For modern people, this is a hard passage to even consider because most people think that the idea that there is a devil or something like that is simply a superstitious approach to life. And, and certainly with all of our technology, we've outgrown that. But I would like to suggest to you that uh, uh, the, the challenges that we experience in life cannot be explained or defined simply by a lack of material things or a lack of education or a lack of opportunity that there are some things we just have no explanation for. When you see evil manifest itself in our world, it's really, I think, a short-sighted thing to suggest that the, the only source of evil is some lack that exists in our world. That scripture actually gives us insight that there are things beyond the material and in spiritual world, not everything is is benevolent. There are malevolent forces in the world, and there's evil in our world, not just because some people don't have access to things. And how do I know this? Because some of the people who have access to everything can do some of the most harm. If it's just a lack of education or just a lack of resources, then all the educated and wealthy people would never do anything evil. But we all know that that's not true. And so, we're gaining insight into something as to how the world actually works, not the way we perceive it works, not the way we've told it works, but how it actually works. And, and, and we're, 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 we're going to see that Jesus is being prepared for something. This is interesting to us because a lot of us think that, that when it comes to faith, there's this spontaneous aspect to it. The, the faith is really, you don't know, you're not prepared, you take a step of faith, you, you trust, you, you hope, you believe that it will come out all right. There, and to be sure, there are plenty of things in life you cannot prepare for. 
But Jesus is being prepared in this season in the wilderness. And I think there's a lot to learn and gain from understanding what he was doing. There is a powerful reality in trusting God in the things that we didn't see coming, but there's also a powerful reality in trusting God to prepare ourselves for things that we even can't foresee coming. And this preparation is essential to our character and to our spiritual growth. Um, if you want to run a marathon, you better prepare for it. Otherwise, uh, you probably won't finish, and if you do, it'll take you a very long time to recover. If you're going into battle, if you're going to serve in the military of our nation, they're going to prepare you in a lot of ways. They, as strong as you might be, they don't want to send you in unprepared. Even our reflexes can be prepared. You know, you've probably been told you have a fight or flight reflex. The, the, the thing is, is, it's hard to decide which of those things you're going to do when you're overwhelmed. And even our reflexes can be trained. The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, and what's really interesting is the first direction the Holy Spirit gives to Jesus is to go to the wilderness. To the wilderness. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And we're told at the end of our reading today that Jesus returned from the wilderness with the power of the Holy Spirit and news about him spread throughout the entire region. During this 40 day of training, Jesus prepared himself for what he would face and what his father wanted to do in his life, which is a really important point. We need to be shaped and trained not only for the trials that lie ahead, but also for the work that God longs to do through us. We're not just preparing for something bad that could happen, but the good that God wants to pour into our lives and through our lives to others. Now, we don't take young men and women and throw them into the battlefield unprepared. We don't take, we don't take athletes. Uh, hopefully, for the last few days, the Buffalo Bills have been preparing uh, for their, uh, and if they didn't, that'll, that'll show up. We don't put even gifted musicians and vocalists into productions without preparation. They may be strong, they may be talented, but if they are unprepared, they will not succeed. There's something about the work of the Spirit in the wilderness that is essential. Now, so what's a wilderness? And a wilderness, according to the original Greek word, is, is a solitary place. You don't have a lot of people around, it's not populated, it's a desolate place, it's uncultivated. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that uh, nothing grows there. It just doesn't grow like when you cultivate things to grow. And it tends to be lonely. And uh, these places are remote, uh, not necessarily easy to get to, and rugged. They're, they tend not to be comfortable. They lack the usual provisions of life in the way we're used to accessing them. And it's a place where we are tested. Tested. But it's also a place where we encounter God. In fact, the prominence of the wilderness in Scripture is remarkable when you start paying attention to it. Moses, when he was fleeing for his life after killing an Egyptian, went to the wilderness. And it was there that he actually encountered God in a bush that was burning but was not consumed. Israel, when they were finally released from Egypt and the hundreds of years of bondage that they had lived in, they go into the wilderness and it's a place where they are going to learn a daily dependence upon God. Their identity is going to be reframed. They're going to learn to depend on him. David, when he's fleeing from King Saul, who wants to kill him just simply because he's an insecure leader. And he can't stand having people around him who are competent. And, and he's looking for ways to kill David. David flees into the wilderness. And this is where he learns humility. And he learns dependence on God. And, and he, learns, he learns even in the midst of close encounters with death that God is closer than that. Uh, David, uh, Elijah. Elijah is a person. He had this incredible confrontation with 450 prophets of Baal. And when that confrontation was over, he's exhausted and he's fatigued and he flees into the wilderness and it's there that God feeds him and breathes life back into him and speaks to him in a still small voice and tells him about the rest of the things that he's going to do in his life. God does some of his best work in the wilderness. 
and yet we will avoid it at all costs. We, we want God to do his best work in the spa. <laughs> we want him to do his best work in, on vacation. And I'm not suggesting that God can't do works in spas and vacations, but I am suggesting that God does some of his best work in the wilderness. Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted. And there's three kind of archetypal uh, uh, temptations that he faces that are going to be absolutely essential to the, to the way he lives out his life, the way that he does his ministry. And Jesus, in these moments, he names the temptations and he, he, he wrestles with them. He responds to them. Um, he didn't plug his ears. Have you ever seen children do that when they don't want to hear something, they plug their ears? I've seen adults do that. I've, I have seen full-grown adults plug their ears and, and start making noise. No, 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 I can't hear you. I was just, you. Okay. The enemy is speaking and Jesus doesn't plug his ears. That's interesting because there's something in the temptation of the enemy that Jesus needs to know what the strategies of the enemy are against him in his life. Second Corinthians gives us, uh, the, second, uh, the second chapter gives us this powerful insight about how the tempter works. He says, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And whatever I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that, this is, the rest of this verse is essential, that Satan not outwit us for we are not unaware of his schemes. It's in the wilderness we're exposed to his schemes. It's in the wilderness that we learn the path of understanding what his strategies are so that he cannot outwit us. Private preparation comes before public victory. Anyone who's ever been involved in sports knows this is true. You, you have to practice in private. You have to build up your body and learn the skills so that when you're in the public contest, you can prevail. Anyone who's good academically, uh, you know it takes time in private. You're reading the literature, you're studying, you're taking notes when the professor's talking so that you can walk across the stage and receive a degree. Our, our desire tends to be to try to control situations, to be in charge. And it's the wilderness that actually reminds us that we're not nearly as in control as we wish that we were. Our desire is for things to go our way. And I won't ask how many of you wish that things would go your way, because some of you wish that I wouldn't ask questions like that and ask people to raise their hands. Who do you trust? Do you find this out in the wilderness? Who do you trust? how we see ourselves. Our view of ourselves is not always accurate. The wilderness is a place where we start sorting some of these things out. The temptations that we ignore are the ones that tend to gain power in our lives. And in the wilderness, we don't have the option of ignoring them. When we don't see temptation coming, we feel unprepared for it. And we tend to respond in ways. I've, I've heard this over and over again in pastoral counseling for many years. People found themselves in a tempting situation and, and they will look at me and they will say, I do not understand why I did what I did. And they're not lying. They're not trying to avoid responsibility. They're saying something that's true. Somehow in the wilderness, they did not face, name, and wrestle with the temptation and have a response to it so that when it shows up in the rest of their life, they have, they're prepared for it. They're prepared for it. We're not, by the way, we're not always tempted to do an evil thing. Sometimes we think that's the only temptation that comes. Sometimes we can be tempted to put off an important thing. I know I'm the only one that struggles with procrastination. We can be tempted to do nothing. 
We can be tempted to be distracted by good things and not give attention to the things that are most important right now. We can overcommit our lives. Why? There's something that we want, but in that overcommitment, we're actually ignoring things that really matter and will be will experience some very negative consequences later in life about. Well, we can distract ourselves from underlying fears. The power of distraction is, is, is amazing. And we can, we can just keep distracting ourselves and we, we don't understand what's going on underneath until finally it breaks through the surface. And if somebody asks us why, we have no idea. We have no answer for them. And we can ignore spiritual reality entirely. We can allow pride to go unnoticed and unchecked. But in the wilderness, we, we don't have those options. All of those things are addressed. Without the Holy Spirit's help, we will drift from the life that God hopes and dreams for us. So it's in the wilderness we learn how to listen. Listen. The biggest challenge, according to Scripture, with people who want to follow God is actually not that they have a rebellious heart. The biggest challenge in scripture uh, is, is not that they are constantly in conflict with other people. I'm not suggesting those things don't occur. I'm just saying that in scripture, it's not the number one thing that is addressed. It's not even failing to love well or following idols. That's not the biggest thing. Do you wanna know what the biggest challenge, according to scripture, over 1,500 verses address this challenge, and that is we don't listen to God. We just don't. We don't listen. If, if you know anything of uh, uh, Jewish religion, you know that the first and foremost command comes out of the book of Deuteronomy, and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And everybody thinks that it starts with the Lord our God is one, but he says, Hear, listen, listen, listen. And it's our inability to listen that gets us into so much trouble. What, we're, what scripture is telling us, we cannot love well if we don't learn to listen well. To listen. Jesus listened to his father in the wilderness. How do I know this? Because he repeats things his father has said. With each temptation, Jesus responds with something God said in scripture. That's a fascinating thing. When he's tempted to turn stones into bread, when the enemy is telling him, nobody as important as you should ever have to have a day when you are hungry. You can do this. You have a right to it. He just, he says, it is written. What's he doing? He's listening to his father and his father's speaking to him right then. It's not possible to live just by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. When he was tempted to seek power and status, all, the, all of the kingdoms of the world offered him, all he's got to do is worship something other than God. And I will tell you, this is one of the great temptations for people. We set our sights on something and we are willing to make an idol of almost anything to get what it is that we want. And Jesus' response is, it is written, worship the Lord God and serve him only. Uh, when he was tempted to try to control God's actions. My, my father used to do this thing with my littlest sister and he would put her up on top of the refrigerator. <laughs> and, and she would say, one, two, three. And she would leap off of the refrigerator and he would catch her in his arms. One day he was in the basement and he heard my sister say, one, Two, three, terrified him. He went running up the stairs as fast as he could. And sure enough, my little sister had found her way to the top of that refrigerator on her own. And she just leapt. And my dad caught her before she hit the floor. Some of us use this strategy with God. We jump off refrigerators he didn't put us up on. And, and we'll, we'll even give him notice. One, two, three. <laughs> Yeah, what's happening? We're, we're trying to control God in a situation. There's some people, that's their whole definition of faith. If you build a big enough hole, God will fill it for you. That's a bad strategy for life. 
Jesus had spent time in scripture, but in the moment he hears his father whispering something to him and he responds with what his father is giving him in that moment. We must also face temptations to ignore scripture or to misuse scripture so that we can control God. You know, there's a whole stream of Christianity about if you find the right verse of scripture and you pray your prayer a certain way, you can pretty much make God do anything you want. So who's God in that model? Is that what we're called to do? God has not put you on this earth to control him or to control anybody else. If you're in the job of trying to control others, go home and write your letter of resignation today. It doesn't work. To receive the Holy Spirit's help when facing temptation, we must first seek his guidance when reading scripture. For some of us, reading scripture is like the task. It, it's like the push-ups that we do in the morning or the pull-ups that we do in the morning. Or, or uh, I know one person, uh, he says that his exercise routine is that he does a half a sit-up when he gets up in the morning and the other half when he goes to bed at night. Like <laughs> kind of like that. And, and so we, we treat it like an exercise and, and the truth is it, it's not what accessing scripture is supposed to be. What we're doing is, is we're, we're putting something in our life that the Holy Spirit can call to our attention, to bring to our memory at a critical and powerful moment. And if we're listening, it makes all the difference in the world. So when you're reading through scripture, don't just look for information. Look to connect with God's spirit in God's word. It, I need the Holy Spirit when I read scripture. I don't assume that just by reason of my training that I can access or assess everything that God has for me in his word. When I read through a section, I'll, I'll ask the Holy Spirit for help. Call something to my attention. Help a word to stand out to me or a phrase. What is, and, and then I'll, I'll kind of focus on that. I'll, I'll pay attention to that. I'll, I'll mull that over in my mind a little bit. I might even write it down. It's, it's just, you know, what, what could this mean? And then I try to carry that, whatever that is, I try to carry that with me through the rest of the day. It's amazing what God can do when we're willing to listen and take what we hear seriously. Now, uh, I can tell you that there are people who are very tempted uh, to, to use God's word for their own preferences or their own prejudices. And uh, that's, that's not what God has called us to do. God hasn't called us to comb through his word, to find the things that we like so we can try to remake the world the way that we like. God's in the business of transforming us and it starts by listening. Now, to be sure, a lot of us are, are tired. Um, we're fatigued, we're exhausted. And here's the challenge, is that the more fatigued we become, the more vulnerable we are to giving in to temptation. Uh, we, we wear ourselves out trying to avoid tempting things in life, and we wear ourselves down, and it makes us more susceptible to the temptations in life. and we don't feel prepared. Now, the wilderness is not by any means a comfortable place, but it is a place where we are refreshed. Our mind doesn't equate those two things. We, we assume the wilderness, if it's rugged and it's a little bit demanding, that somehow I cannot be refreshed, but scripture tells us something completely different. Jesus wasn't just tempted in the wilderness, he was strengthened in the wilderness, and we can be too. Ask the worship team to, to come. So what could you do? You could plan a little wilderness time. I know you probably don't have 40 days to go <clears throat> and, and hide out in the wilderness. And even if you did, I suspect that your family might not appreciate your abandoning them for that period of time. 
But there are places that we can go that it's us and God, and it might not be a comfortable place. It doesn't have to be 40 days, it doesn't have to be 40 minutes. But the time you spend with God in a place where it's just you and Him, where you get to think about and wrestle through things, where you get to name the temptations that lay claim to your soul, your mind and your heart, where out of something internal, the Word of God begins to percolate up, and it's actually the response that you need for the challenge or the temptation that you're facing. Why does the Holy Spirit lead us into the wilderness? And the answer is because we're unlikely to go there on our own. We avoid wildernesses. We do. But if you're willing to be led by the Spirit into a place where it's just you and God. And I know, if you are a mother of a toddler, right now you are ready to throw an empty bottle at me and say, are you kidding me? You cannot be serious. There is no peace and quiet in my house. I crave a wilderness. Give it to me. I dare you. And uh, I, would just, I would just say to you, uh, it's going to be like this for a while. <laughs> It does get better. But there's wildernesses in, in rooms where toddlers run and cry and bottles have to be washed and filled. There's wildernesses when, when people stop talking in a house. And they retreat to their silent corners or their screens. There's wildernesses when our fears overwhelm us and the sphere of our life keeps getting smaller and smaller. And we don't know how much longer we can breathe. It's a hard place to be. It's a lonely place to be. It's a rugged place to be. The nutrition, the, the things you need to survive don't seem obvious in those places. And all I can tell you is in those moments, in those moments, in those moments, listen. God wants to whisper something to you that will strengthen you, that will encourage you, that will prepare you, and that will help release you unto all that he has called you to do and to be. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Heavenly Father, For those in the wilderness today, let them hear your voice. For those of us who avoid the wilderness today, would you help us surrender to the direction of your spirit? Take us places we would not go on our own so that we can be prepared for what lies ahead. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.